Good morning. The service will begin shortly. Good morning. Welcome to our time of worship on this first Sunday after Easter. I'm so glad that Pastor Donna will be leading our service today, right after I finish with some announcements. By the way, her husband Bruce will also be participating in today's service. We're hoping that Pastor Charlie can also join us soon to lead us. He and Evie are doing well, and we're working on some technical issues so that Charlie can bring a sermon or lead in some other way in the service. Now, by way of announcements, as you can imagine, not a lot is going on in the church. But we do have a Bible study on Thursday evenings, and you can join that Bible study by typing in what you see on the bottom of the slide there, Sydney-Fairview Bible Study. And for this particular Thursday evening, type in April 23. And that will take you to the um, uh, Bible Study on YouTube. Now, when you come to the Bible Study, please feel free to post comments or questions in the area below. Uh, the viewing screen when you participate in the Bible study. I will respond to your comments and questions either to you directly or as part of the Bible study the following week. All right, here now is Pastor Donna with an introduction to today's worship and a call to worship. Welcome to Holy Humor Sunday. In some Christian circles today, it is called Holy Humor Sunday. It is the day we celebrate the joke that God pulled on Satan. God has outwitted the devil and overcome death. Jesus is alive and God has the final laugh. Can you imagine what Easter meant to the first Christians? For them, it wasn't a serious time. It wasn't a somber time. It was a joy-filled time, a time to dance, a time to laugh, a time to sing at the top of your lungs. It was a time for joy. The celebration of Holy Humor Sunday started out as Bright Monday or White Monday in various countries. It was a time of celebration characterized by joking around, singing, dancing, merrymaking, and of course, sharing a meal, a time to celebrate the joy of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. One of the quainter customs associated with Easter in the past was the Easter laugh. On Easter Sunday evening, parishioners returned to the church for our solemn celebration and evening prayers. In the course of this evening service, the clergy would entertain the parishioners with jokes and funny stories. The purpose of this unusual practice was to contrast Easter joy with the solemnness of the Lenten season just completed. This tradition began in the 13th century, I suspect about the time that clowning was also popular in the medieval churches. But churches authorities gradually suppressed it as it as it improper and an abuse during the 17th and 18th century. In some ways that is just too bad. Well, some 34 years ago, on April Fool's Day, a group of Christians came together and declared themselves to be the Fellowship of Merry Christians. From that gathering came the joyful new noise letter. In their newsletter, they encouraged the church to bring back the celebration of the Easter laugh. Let us turn our hearts toward God and begin our worship. Will you join me in the call to worship? The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Joy rings through the skies. For God's love is alive in our hearts. Happiness cascades like a mountain stream. For God's word brings new life. Delight ripples through the trees. For God's grace heals our wounds. Let your songs raise the roof. For God is great and worthy of praise. Thank 
angels' wings, I see glory on His face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. As we go before the Lord today in prayer, I want us to focus on the good things we are seeing despite the continuing COVID-19 crisis. I trust you are spending time in prayer throughout the week, and as you pray, you are enjoying the presence of God. His presence, what John Wesley called the witness of the Spirit, reminds us always that God is with us. His Holy Spirit lives within us, and although there is much sadness in the world, we can have an unexplainable joy in his presence. We can also rejoice in the progress that has been made against this pandemic. Progress in testing, progress in treatment, a higher survival rate, and a decreasing number of people catching this virus. So, despite all that we hear, there's much to be thankful for. At the same time, we want to pray especially for those who are on the front lines in our emergency rooms, intensive care rooms, laboratories, and other places where the fight continues to go on. This battle, as you know, is not an American battle. It is a worldwide battle. And then we cannot fail to pray for leaders around the world who are faced with making very difficult decisions. Here in America, we must pray for our president and vice president <clears throat> and all the committee members and members of Congress who face a significant challenge as they lead us through to victory over this pandemic. And then pray for our governors who likewise must make difficult decisions. They need all the guidance they can get. How about our neighbors and family members? our co-workers and friends. If you find yourself saddened by all that is happening, depressed, irritable, fearful, maybe a bit stir-crazy, you can be sure that those you know are feeling similar feelings. Pray for them. In fact, you might also call and check on them and pray for them over the phone. All right? Let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for hearing the prayers of your people today. Lord, it's easy for us to focus on the troubling times and the sad times that we are in. But you've not called us to defeat or to sadness, to be cast down. You have given us light and life and love. Help us, Lord, to discipline our thinking so that we don't wallow in despair. Rather, help us to think about our God, our Father, our Savior, the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Help us to think about the hope we have in Christ. Remind us of your promises to us, never to leave us nor forsake us, and other promises, many of them. We are not destined for defeat. We are destined for victory. Our Lord has already won the victory for us. 
And he defeated sin, he defeated Satan, he defeated death. And he surely will bring us through to triumph. Hallelujah. We lift to you today, O Lord, all those who in some way are involved in this battle. From the highest levels of leaders in our national government, down to our states, to our hospital administrators and personnel, to our first responders. We pray, O Lord, for a great measure of grace and wisdom to be upon all of them. Dear Lord, protect those who put many hours in every day to treat those who are ill. They need strength. O oh God, in the midst of all of this, may the truth of the gospel be expressed. May Christians bear witness of their faith and their hope in Christ boldly. And may many come to faith in Christ in this darkest of hours. We pray today, Lord, for our own family members, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors. Many are deeply saddened by the isolation. They're lonely and confused. Some are tempted to return to old habits and lifestyles that are destructive to them and injurious to their loved ones. Help them, we pray. Invade their troubled hearts and pour out your peace in them. Give them assurance that this will end in due time and we will all be together again. And may we all hear the still small voice of your spirit who assures us and comforts us in times of trouble. O oh Lord, we praise your holy name for your great love and power in such a time as this, have mercy upon us all, O God. And now, O Lord, help us to take to heart the words of that prayer which Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
please join me now in the prayer for illumination. Loving God, as you open the tomb and raise Jesus to new life, so open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture lesson today is from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, and I'm reading the message version. Later, on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but Philfer of the Jews had blocked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you, just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they are gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he focused attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. Jesus said, So you believe because you've seen with your own eyes? Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. Because today is Holy Humor Sunday, I decided to start this sermon with some humor. A neighbor asked Joseph why he gave away his beautifully hand-hewn tomb to someone else. Joseph replied, well, he only needed it for the weekend. A pastor made it a practice that on Easter Sunday to go to each Sunday school class and talk with the children about what happened on Easter Sunday. She had told the five-year-old class all about the stone being rolled away and Jesus coming out of the tomb. And then she asked the class, what do you think were the first words that Jesus spoke when he came out of the tomb? No one answered. It was dead silence, which was unusual for this class. And then one little girl jumped up and shouted, ta-da! It was Saturday, the day before Easter, and Joanne Hinch of Woodland Hills, California, was sitting at the kitchen table coloring eggs with her son, who was three years old, and her daughter, who was two. She told her kids all about Easter and taught them the traditional Easter morning greeting and response, he has risen, he has risen indeed. The children planned to surprise their dad, a Presbyterian minister, with that greeting as soon as he woke the next morning. Easter arrived, and little Dan, her three-year-old son, heard his father stirring in his bedroom. So the boy got up quickly and dashed down the hall, shouting at the top of his lungs, Daddy, 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 God's back! Holy Humor Sunday is a testament to the, to the God who, as the psalmist says, sits in the heavens and laughs at any forces that might seek to prevent divine purpose. The resurrection is comedy of the best sort, the unexpected reversal of expectation. Mary comes to the tomb on Easter morning expecting to find a dead body. Her train of thought is racing down one track, and she almost literally stumbles over the risen Lord. 
humor of the highest order. Resurrection reverses the expectations of gloom and doom in the face of death and instead brings celebration. And we hear shouts of Alleluia. According to the three-year cycle of the church's lectionary scripture readings, the gospel lesson is always the same for the first Sunday after Easter. It is the story of the risen Christ's appearance to the disciples in the upper room on Easter evening. When it, it is also notes that at that time that Thomas is absent. When told of Christ's appearance, Thomas's response is one of doubt about their claims of resurrection. When they gather one week later, Thomas is with them. When the risen Christ appears again, we watch the doubters' wonderful about face. Or perhaps we should say about faith. And here Thomas proclaimed, my Lord, my God. Thomas, doubting Thomas, I've always felt sorry for him. One incident, one remark after an intensely traumatic experience, the murder of his master has colored our understanding of him every, every since. It makes no difference that the rest of his life was marked by faithful service to his Lord. Thomas became Doubting Thomas, and now his name is used to describe a person who is a skeptic. I don't think it's fair to call him Doubting Thomas. We meet Thomas three times in the scripture. The first time is in the 11th chapter of John. Jesus had just heard that his friend Lazarus was so sick that he was about to die. Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha lived in Bethany near Jerusalem. But Jesus and the disciples were some miles away across the, the Jordan. They had gone there to escape the hostility of the temple leaders who had recently tried to have Jesus stoned. Word finally came that it was too late. Lazarus was dead. Two days go by, and suddenly, like a boat out of the blue, Jesus up and says, Let's go over to Bethany to see Lazarus. The disciples say, Wait a minute. It's too risky. You are liable to be killed if you go near to Jerusalem. But Jesus responds, Lazarus is asleep. I must go to wake him. Now the disciples are even more confused. What do you mean you have to go and wake him? If he is asleep, that means he's getting better. Then Jesus explains, I don't mean asleep asleep. I mean asleep dead. Let's go. So the 12 know how dangerous it is to make such a trip, especially if it is only to pay last respects. And they try to convince Jesus it's too dangerous to go. But now Thomas, the one called doubter all these many centuries, shows us another side. No doubter here. We find a Thomas who says to the rest, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas, a faithful friend, faithful even unto death. The next time we find Thomas in scripture is in the 14th chapter of John. The disciples had, had gathered to celebrate Passover. Jesus was trying to explain to them that the time had come for him to fulfill his purpose on earth. Jesus would be leaving them. He would be returning to the Father, but he was doing it so that these 12, as well as all of the countless others and us who would believe would be able to join him there. Jesus talked about my father's house and many dwelling places and going to, a, to prepare a place which left the disciples wondering just what in the world Jesus is talking about. And I'm guessing they were afraid they would sound stupid to ask, what are you talking about? So they didn't ask. But then we have Thomas, not doubting Thomas, but thoughtful Thomas. If he had a question, he would ask it, even when no one else would. Do you remember the scene? Jesus had just finished saying that he was going to prepare a place for them all in his father's house, and that one day they would join him there. Jesus said, and you know the way to the place I am going. Thomas interrupts Jesus with a, wait a minute, Lord. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? That is a good question. And it's got a great answer. Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. 
Yes, Thomas was thoughtful, and that is good. A faith that requires acceptance without thinking is not faith. Now we meet Thomas for the third and last time in today's reading. The other gospels, the other disciples tell Thomas that they have seen Jesus and he has risen from the dead, but Thomas cannot believe it. Thomas's unbelief prevents him from seeing the joy on his friends' faces, and he is blind to the fact that Jesus is risen. It is not as if Thomas refuses to accept the possibility of the dead being raised. After all, he has seen that very thing happen with the daughter of Jairus, the son of the widow, and he has seen it with Lazarus. But this is different. Jesus had not died of natural causes, causes that would somehow miraculously be reversed by the intervention of the Son of God. This was murder, spears and nails and a cross murder. A thoughtful man would have to say that this kind of death is not reversible. And Thomas tells the others precisely that. Unless I see the marks of the nail in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. To Thomas, this was not possible. So we get doubting Thomas, not faithful friend Thomas or thoughtful Thomas, but doubting Thomas. That's not fair. Then Jesus came to the disciples a week later and praise the Lord, Thomas was with them. After greeting everyone, Jesus focuses attention on Thomas. He says to Thomas, take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. We may call ourselves Easter people, but we live in a Good Friday world. We all have been doubting Thomases at one time or another. Maybe even this morning you find yourself in the same boat as Thomas. I found myself in that boat as I have followed the orders to shelter in place. And I found myself in that boat again when I got a text from my daughter that told us she had Corbin 19. Life has become overwhelming, scary, uncertain, even chaotic. A virus so tiny we cannot, cannot even see the, with our naked eyes. It has entered our world. It has entered people, even people we know. We have been dealt crushing blows of having to stay away from those we love and care about. Businesses and jobs closing with friends and family being laid off and death, which leaves us grieving into despair. The message of the gospel is to those who cannot see the Easter joy. Open your eyes, see what God has done, celebrate it. Jesus is alive. This is a reminder we all need from time to time. Life can be so burdensome and overwhelming. We can be depressed and discouraged and despondent. We can get so far down that we cannot even see or remember the way up. And then along comes a day like today, and we are reminded of the love that Jesus has for us. And we celebrate his love, and we find his peace, his joy, and renewed hope. Yes, this is a day to celebrate the victory of the resurrection over death and the grave. A day to remember that the word of Jesus who said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Happy Holy hum Humor Sunday. Be joyful. And in the words of Peter Marshall, let us never live another day as if Jesus were dead. Amen. Join me in the affirmation of faith. We believe in God who works in the hidden stillness of every dawn, who beckons us to visit the tomb of our fears so we might discover the birth of hope, who sends reoccurring dreams and fragrant flowers and good friends and bright angels with messages of joy and possibility. We believe in Jesus, the risen Christ, who meets us on every path, who greets us with respect and names and calms our fears and bids us walk and talk as children of the light, who is always going before us into the workplace and the play space. We believe in the Holy Spirit who gathers us into a kindred community, 
who works through the lame and the late, the wrinkled and the newborn, the hurting and the hopeful, who nudges our prayers, kindles our longings, and prompts our praises. We believe we are called to be Easter people, challenging despair with glowing hope, acting peacefully in the midst of painful Good Fridays, and living joyfully even in the midst of harsh realities. We believe in the church, the hand-holding, hearty singing, and passionate, caring fellowship of seekers and finders. This we believe. Please join me now in the prayer for our benediction. Lord, as I stumble through this life, help me to create more laughter than tears, dispense more happiness than gloom, spread more cheer than despair. Never let me become so indifferent that I will fail to see the wonder in the eyes of a child or the twinkle in the eyes of the aged. Never let me forget that my total effort is to cheer people make them happy and forget, at least for the moment, all the unpleasant things in their lives. And Lord, in my final moment, may I hear you whisper, when you made my people smile, you made me smile. Amen. <laughs>